Well, welcome to our cultural talk story series. Uh, my name is Jose Barzola for the Matsunaga at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Today's event uh, is co-sponsored by the Alabama Indigenous Coalition and the Matsunaga for Peace. Our talk story today will focus on Alabama Indigenous Coalition dismantling educational oppression with Valerie Thomas and Tori Nicole Jackson. Thank you for joining us today to sit down at our table to learn about Indigenous communities. Today's event uh, will be live streamed on our community Facebook page and uh, through the 100 Infantry Battalion Veterans Education Center, aka Club 100, Alabama Indigenous Coalition, the Conflict Resolution Alliance, KTUH Honolulu, and the Mountain for Peace. Uh, join us to learn about the goals and objectives of the Alabama Indigenous Coalition. This organization was created not only to bridge the gaps between indigenous communities, but also to invite those who are willing to listen. The Alabama Indigenous Coalition invites listeners to have honest conversation about our history, ways to improve education, and lastly, delve into ways we can all make a change together for the betterment of our communities. <clears throat> the Alabama Indigenous Coalition is a Native-led nonprofit working, nonprofit working towards a future where all Native people and communities are visible, respected, and treated equally both in Alabama and across the country. In 2019, the AIC was instrumental in securing an official proclamation from the city of Tuskegee, Alabama, renaming Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. In Tuskegee, Alabama, in 2020, they partnered with the city of Montgomery to have Indigenous Peoples Day formally recognized. The AIC has facilitated several virtual and live events and are actively involved in several partnerships with area tribes, local organizations, the city of Montgomery, air nonprofits, universities, and small businesses. Uh, we're going to start today's event by introducing our special guest. Uh, Valerie Adams is from Wombly, South Dakota, located on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and the home of the Oglala Lakota Siad Nation, where Valerie is an enrolled member. Valerie co-founded and became president of the AIC in July 2020 as a native-led nonprofit organization to address the need in Alabama to advocate for indigenous education equity. Valerie is an active member in the Montgomery community and advocates for youth, education, social justice, and indigenous issues. Tori Nicole Jackson is a visual artist and activist based in central Alabama, along with her African and European roots. She's also descendants of the Muskogee peoples. Uh, growing up, she and her family often found that the community in their area had an immense lack of knowledge for not only the existence of Black Native Americans, but also Indigenous history in general. Through her art and the AIC, Tori hopes to bring inspiration, compassion, education, and balance to the community. And to get us started, I'm going to turn it over to Valerie. Thank you very much, Jose. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Recording. Can you hear me? Uh, good afternoon from Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, we're speaking to you from the ancestral homeland of the Muscogee Creek removed from this land and who are now located in Oklahoma. Alabama is the home of one federally recognized tribe, the Porch Creek of Indians, and eight state recognized tribes. We want to thank uh, Spark and Matsunaga Institute for Peace and Justice and Jose Barzola for this wonderful opportunity to be included in this cultural talk series. Because we are addressing indigenous education and its lifelong learning experience for all of us, I would like to take a moment and introduce myself to you in my own language as part of my le own learning process. Hamadakyapi, Valerie Adams, Amachiapi, Sto, Wambli, Hope, Imatahan, Na Lanao, Montgomery, Alabama, El Watie, Ma Lakota, Sto, Chante, Washte, Nape, Chiuzako, Sto. Hello, my relatives. My name is Valerie Adams. I am from Wambli, South Dakota, and currently living in Montgomery, Alabama. I am Lakota. I shake your hand with a good heart. In another variation of the introduction, we are expected to give our given tribal name and family heritage. In an effort to save time, I included photos of my Tioshpai, this is my family, and my tribal emblem on this slide. I am one of the co-founders and president of the Alabama Indigenous Coalition, a native-led 501c3. AIC was created in October 2019 to fill a void in increasing relevant and accurate indigenous education, awareness, and opportunities in Alabama. I want to go ahead and take a moment, introduce my friend and sister, Tori Nicole Edwards, co-founder and vice president of Advancement, 
of AIC who will be presenting today's topic in Dismantling Education Oppression. Hello, everyone. I am Tori Nicole Edwards. I know my, my name says Jackson. I just got married. Um, so um, I am the Vice President of Advancement for the Alabama Indigenous Coalition. I am Black Native American and a descendant of the Muscogee peoples. I have a degree in psychology and art, and I am also a visual artist. I uh, have been using my art to educate people. Um, I, I really didn't think of it as a source of education uh, until somebody thought that Geronimo was somebody from um, the Game of Thrones. And so after that, I thought I should probably paint more um, of, of our um, ancestors and historical figures and strike up a conversation so that people will be able to discuss and, and learn about the culture. Uh, we all also wanted to include some of the work that we've done with various media, including some podcasts, uh, We Teach Us and Forward South that helped us get our start, as well as some of the media that we've been on in our quest with Indigenous Peoples Day, um, and also several partnerships that we have with, of course, the city of Tuskegee, the city of Montgomery, D Road Cafe, 1977 Books, Alabama Dep Department of Public Health, Beauty and Beyond, Women in Training Program, Rites of Passage, More Than Tours, Kari Creative, The King's Canvas, and Terrible Master Film. And with that, I'm going to lead and let Tori take over. Okay, so our motto is to acknowledge, educate, and celebrate. So what is AIC? Alabama Indigenous Coalition is a nonprofit organization created to bridge the gaps between native and indigenous communities. We're striving for not only Alabama tribes and communities to have equal voices, but also other tribal nations to join in on the conversation in order to increase awareness and comprehensive understanding of various different indigenous cultures, history, and art. Um, we provide a platform for open dialogue and discussion, and our mission is to correct the education system while providing resources and ways to get involved. I, if you know me, you know that I'm super passionate about children. I love children. Um, and it is never too late or, or too early to begin teaching the truth to children. Um, when we see children in the early childhood setting, this is an opportunity to set the tone for perspectives on life. When we group uh, Native Americans into one group, uh, this causes misinformation and it creates stereotypes and the potential for mockery. Um, for children who are Native, or have indigenous ancestry, this creates a feeling of isolation, confusion, and could uh, cause low self-esteem. Um, other results uh, to a lack of Native American history um, are the creation of a false narrative, false history on important documents such as the Dolls Act, the Doctrine of Discovery, and even the Declaration of Independence, which still states Native Americans as merciless Indian savages. Um, a common misconception that Native Americans were pointlessly attacking settlers when in fact they or we uh, were trying to defend um, our, our land, um, mistreatment of the environment and repeated history. So we want to talk about um, erasure. Um, and it's, it's difficult to say uh, how many natives uh, were here previously before erasure, but it's stated to be between 2.1 million and 18 million indigenous people. Um, and after Columbus, um, about 90% of the population was wiped out. Uh, this number was even lower after President Andrew Jackson enforced the Indian Removal Act. And as you can see to the right, there are so many different um, different varieties of, you know, 
being Native and the Indigenous community. So the Doctrine of Discovery, um, that the Doctrine of Discovery was issued by Pope Alexander of the Roman Catholic Church, May 4th, 1493. Um, the doctrine of discovery was a legal premise that governed European conquest to the new world and continues to have implications for property, property rights today. Um, it stated that any land not inhibited by Christians was available to be discovered and claimed or conquered. Um, it also states that barbarous nations are subject to be overthrown and brought to Christian faith. Because it was never renounced, currently court systems still cite this legal precedent to decipher property right cases presented by Native Americans against the US and non-natives. Today, we can see this being played out through mineral exploitation, medicinal plants uh, here in America. Um, I know that they are um, largely exploiting uh, peyote at the moment, uh, oil exploitation on native lands, water rights, and the uprooting of sacred burial grounds. So Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus was an Italian explorer falsely credited with discovering new lands which were already inhabited by indigenous peoples. His expeditions were sponsored by the Catholic monarchs of Spain and uh, yet his expeditions were noted as being uh, some of the first European contact with the Caribbean islands, uh, Central and South America. The primary goal of his was to conquer new lands and pillage for gold or riches. Um, so now I'm going to uh, go into a little bit about his, his journal. Um, it says, first encounters between Europeans and Native Americans were dramatic events. In this account, we see the assumptions and intentions of Christopher Columbus as he immediately began assessing the potential of these people to serve European economic interests. He also uh, predicted easy success for missionaries seeking to, to convert these people to Christianity. So um, here, is, here is a visual guide of his, uh, of his journal. I'm not gonna read the whole thing because it is a bit lengthy. Um, at the top, he's just kind of stating um, how, how poor they are, the natives are, and how they were just easily amused by these glass beads that he just thought were just trash uh, in, in his eyes. He just thought they were worthless. Um, so I'm going to start down here. And it says, it appeared to me to be a race of people, people very poor in everything. They go as naked as when their mothers bore them, and so do the women, although I did not see more than one young girl. All I saw were youths, none more than 30 years of age. They are very well made with handsome bodies and very good countenances. Their hair is short and coarse, almost like that of a horse's tail. And let's see, I'm going to skip down here to about here. Um, they have no iron, their darts being wands without iron, some of them having a fish's tooth at the end and others being pointed in various ways. They are all of fair stature and size and with good laces and well made. I saw some with marks of wounds on their bodies and I made signs to ask what it was. And they gave me to understand that people from other adjacent islands came with the intention of seizing them and that they defended themselves. I believe and still believe that they come here from the mainland to take them prisoners. They should be good servants and intelligent for I observed they quickly took to what was said to them. So atrocities that occurred under the rule of Columbus. Um, Columbus created the tribute system which stated that all Tainos were tasked with paying the settler at least 25 pounds of cotton or a lar large hawk's bell of gold dust. Um, if their tasks were not completed, their hands were cut off and often tied around their necks. Um, there are also some accounts of um, him or his men just leaving a bit of skin so that they would just dangle off of their bodies, which is just really gross and brutal. Um, so about 10,000 Tainos were found to have died without hands. Um, I'm sure there were more. This is probably just as many bodies as they found. 
Um, women were often often uh, offered to Columbus's men and were consistently taken advantage of. He organized a slave raid in which 1,500 Arawak men, women, and children were rounded up and put into pens only for Columbus and his men to select the best natives and ship them to Spain to be sold as slaves. Columbus is quoted as saying, let us in the name of the Holy Trinity go on sending all the slaves that can be sold. Natives were used in barba bar barbaric experiments such as being cut in half and children's legs were uh, cut from beneath them due to the men wanting to test the sharpness of their swords. Uh, infants were also cut into pieces and given to dogs when they ran out of dog food. So due to the fact um, that there was an oncoming uh, extinct extinction, the Arawak tribe uh, tried to defend themselves and fight back, but they were unsuccessful. Um, any Arawak that was captured was noted to either be burned or hung. Uh, due to this, the Arawaks began committing mass suicides to save themselves and their children from mutilation, torture, and enslavement by the Spaniards. It is said that at least half of the of the population was wiped out within two years. So AIC and the fight to abolish Columbus Day. Valerie, do you wanna take this part over? Uh, sure. Uh, sure. Um, um, I, when, we were, when we were talking about, about I have an echo. Uh-oh. Okay. okay. In the beginning, we were meeting and talking about, about what can we do to further our, um, we decided that abolishing Columbus Day would be the best option. Um, so part of that journey was going to Tuskegee. Um, when we got to Tuskegee, um, we realized that there was a certainty that Native people were still thriving there. Of course, they did not quite know who they were, um, but after the meeting, you know, they came up to us and introduced themselves and spoke of the tribes that they did come from. Um, while we were here in Montgomery um, the first time, I think that was the time when we were trying to talk to people that weren't willing to listen, that this, you know, that Columbus Day should be left alone, that we were trying to hash something that we that should is the past is the past and what what are we going to do and so fueling that fire um coming back the second year we were able to get have montgomery alabama formally recognize indigenous people uh, indigenous people's day um still some work to be done there but um going forward you know the creation of aic is meant for the freedom of all of us as indigenous people to be heard. Tori. Oh, wait, it's not. Hold on. Oh, there we go. Okay, so um, one of the results of uh, Indigenous Peoples Day um, is the Muscogee Peoples Project. Um, this was created by myself for teachers and parents who are looking for an appropriate way to educate their children about natives in the tri-county area, area. But of course this, I mean, this applies to the state of Alabama um, when we're talking about Muscogee people um, and I mean, further out as well. Um, the project is sponsored by the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, the Muscogee People's Project provides uh, visual aid for the children in regards to traditional attire, beliefs and representation of how di diverse the native community is. Uh, it's a great alternative uh, for uh, a Thanksgiving project um, and it's respectful to the community. And if you would like to be involved with the project in the upcoming year, please contact Casey Norman at the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts. Um, and I've listed her email here below. It's knorman, N-O-R-M-A-N at mmfa.org. Um, basically, the museum will pr provide a shape of a person, um, and I have uh, drawn out um, 
little figures of, of clothing and and they'll be provided with ribbons and the children will get to decorate their person and the teacher will then take um, her sacred fire that is included in, in the package and she will place the people around the fire man woman man woman as we do at green corn ceremony so aic and indigenous people's day um, we now host an annual gathering for people to come out and learn about Indigenous peoples. Uh, speakers from numerous tribes come out to be a part of the event. Uh, you can catch dancers from the Mississippi Band of Choctaw, but you can see Isaiah, um, his picture is up here on the right, the upper right side. He's an incredible dancer. Um, you can watch stomp dance demonstrations from the Muscogee Nation. Um, at the bottom left, you can see uh, Carol Lynn and her um, traditional Ribbon skirt, um, her and her mother, uh, Deborah Jenkins, are really big supporters of AIC, and we appreciate them a lot for always coming out and supporting the events. And you can get educated on numerous traditions, ceremonial practices, and attire. Um, on the bottom right here, uh, we had the privilege of having Kate Herrera Jenkins speak. Um, she spoke about how uh, yoga uh, incorporates with her Pueblo culture. And it spans across actually a lot of native communities because movement is a, a very large part of many ceremonies. Um, we also do an annual uh, march. I was just extremely determined to do something in honor of the Trail of Tears. Um, so we basically uh, march from the middle of Montgomery to the Capitol. It's not very far, but um, it's something to uh, to just remember how how far they had to walk. Um, so here's just a kind of a visual um, visual aid to the left. Um, there were so uh, many natives had to walk um, five thousand or more miles during the Trail of Tears. And this is, the Trail of Tears um, is a really important uh, part of history that I feel really strongly about should be taught truthfully in the school, in the school system. Um, it was a part of the Indian Removal Act that was enforced by Andrew Jackson from about 1830 to 1850. Um, the Removal Act is said to have relocated about um, or more than 100,000 Native Americans. According to some who, some of the uh, earlier officials, the best way to solve the Indian problem was to civilize all nations and convert them to Christianity. This includes, but isn't limited to uh, learning to speak English, adopting European practices such as land ownership, and in some cases, uh, slave uh, or ownership of people um, and clothing attire. Uh, this is where the term five civilized tribes derives from. Uh, the five civilized tribes include Creek, Seminole, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Cherokee. Many died of diseases, uh, starvation, and exposure to harsh weather conditions. Uh, elders and children who passed were uh, left in makeshift shallow graves um, while the babies were laid inside of holes in trees. So the results of relocation, uh, loss of language, separation from families, separation from culture, isolation from tribal communities. Uh, since many Native Americans did not obtain US citizenship, which is crazy, until around the year 1924, they were considered to be wards of the state and denied basic human rights. Some of these rights included um, the right to work, hunt, vote, or travel. And this includes traveling from different tribal locations, which could be especially problematic to those who were separated in previous years. Um, religion, until the American Indian Religious Freedom Act of 1978, Native Americans were not legally permitted to practice traditional uh, worship ceremonies or practices. And this leads us to boarding school. So on the right um, is a painting done by Bobby Martin, who is an incredible artist. If you haven't seen or heard of, of his, his work, um, I would highly advise that you look into it um, because it gives you a, a visual aid of 
what a lot of Native Americans had to endure, uh, especially during these times, um, it was, so the boarding schools were established during the 19th and mid 20th century. And the goal of the schools was to assimilate Native American children. Um, often established by Christian missionaries, children were forced to wear their hair in European hairstyles. Natives were beaten if they spoke in their native tongue. Their skin was often scrubbed in a very rough manner um, immediately when they got there. Um, there were countless documented cases of sexual, mental, and physical abuse, mostly occurring in church-run schools. Um, as a result of the horrendous living situation, some Native Americans and mixed Natives alike hid their Native ancestry in order to avoid being shipped off to boarding schools during this time as when many Natives would pass as black or white. So federally recognized natives, dolls rolls, and the blood quantum situation. Um, federally recognized Indian tribe is a legal term of art in the United States law. Um, note that because of the harsh treatment of Native Americans, some natives consciously chose to steer clear of federal recognition in fear of what might happen. Uh, the dolls rolls was created by the United States to subdivide Native American tribal communal uh, land holdings into allotments for native heads of families and individuals. It was a basic roll call of native citizens and uh, freedmen of the five, five civilized tribes. Because natives went in so many different directions, not all natives were included in allotment. Many natives who were mixed with any black ancestry were excluded from the rolls. Uh, documentation was problematic as the census was notorious for changing race because of the one drop rule or appearance. Uh, in the southeastern region, many natives, Native Americans uh, were uh, accounted for as mulatto. Um, Five dollar Indians uh, was a thing. Uh, there were uh, white men who paid uh, five dollars to be added to the dolls rolls and this earned them a fraudulent place on the dolls rolls. Uh, in some cases, some natives were said to change their names in order to sound more civil or due to a legibility situation. Valerie, did you have anything to comment as far as this goes? Uh, yes, I can comment on that. I think when we were having this conversation about blood quantum and the role of being federally recognized, we were discussing the fact that it means something different to different tribes. So the status itself has to do with treaties, the status of, of sovereignty. And so you have some tribes that maintain their blood quantum within, within their constitutions. Um, the Cherokee have recently taken blood out of their constitution. Um, some of the others, you have to trace your lineage back. Um, to, with the Dawes rules, or in, in my case, we have to go back about four or five generations in order to, in order to be enrolled in the tribe. Um, I think that at this time, it's a point of contention for everyone. Um, I've, I've, I've learned of a tribe that recently took all their members back to four fourths in order to make sure that they still were able to keep their sovereignty. So we hope that you know, with the advent of Deb Haland in place at the Department of the Interior, that some of these things can be taken, you know, looked at a little bit closer in terms of how we visualize ourselves. Because, you know, in the in the in the South, particularly with people having to hide who they were, lest they be the removed as well. Um, were having to call themselves black, or you know, um, some tribes may have gotten white washed, whitewashed. Even some tribes, you know, were taken advantage of with their allotment status. And so, you know, as we look at federally, you know, what is federally recognized? How can I get enrolled and things of that nature? There's there's a lot to take into consideration. Yeah, you made some really good points. Um, Okay, so how can you take action? Um, land acknowledgement uh, is 
is a huge part of it. Um, include indigenous peoples and Native Americans in the conversation, celebrate indigenous brilliance, support indigenous artists and authors, uh, look into uh, how your local school system presents Native Americans and indigenous history, a uh, motion to take down Columbus Day in your area and replace it with Indigenous Peoples Day and follow the Alabama Indigenous Coalition on Facebook and Instagram. So did we have any, any questions at all? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we actually had somebody from the audience. Um, they said, um, I have ancestors who are listed as 100% Cherokee, mm -hmm. then made freedmen and purged later from the Dawes. So how do we claim our tribal membership? You want me to take that? I can yeah. take that. Um, um, Sophia, um, I have recently found out that the freedmen with the Cherokee, that they were written into that constitution. Um, and so with that, they have recently, not recently, maybe a couple years, started reallowing people to uh, be enrolled in the tribe. The Dawes Rolls itself is a very sophisticated document because of that removal of the Cherokee and the Creek and the Choctaw and the Chickasaw. And you would probably have to find um, your link back to that tribe, give them the last name that you know, you know was actually a part of that tribe in order to make the case to get enrolled. I think that they have their own, you know, each of those tribes have their own site set up where you could go in there um, and ask, you can email them, you can fill out the contact form, you can print the, print the enrollment paperwork. Um, but again, they do, they, they are accepting, um, they are accepting applications. I know Is that, that um, I know for the Choctaw Nation, and this was in 2017, you needed to have, um, birth certificates leading all the way back to that particular ancestor that is on the doll's roll. So you're going to have to have uh, documentation of birth certificates in order to be enrolled. Thank you so much for that. Um, something else, um, oh yes, they suggested, uh, thank you. Uh, they have the actual documents listing them on the Dawes roll, so we'll definitely follow up. Wonderful. Glad you're able to. <laughs> I wouldn't even know where to start with that. So thank you so much for your knowledge on that. Um, uh, any other questions from our audience today? Um, I know someone had asked how many people are attending today. We have about 75 people in our Zoom event today, but we are live streaming on a couple different Facebook uh, pages. And so the number is definitely going to be higher. And this is being recorded and so it'll be uh, posted on the Matsunaga YouTube channel uh, within 48 hours. And so we'll be able to share this further as well. Um, oh, here we got somebody else. Um, as a genealogist, I'm not fond of documents nor oral histories. There are many reasons why these are inaccurate. Is there any use being made of DNA tests? DNA tests are such a, stick, a sticky situation. Almost like I'm almost afraid to comment on it because it's such a <laughs> sticky situation. Um, well, it seems like a business nowadays that all these DNA test companies come popping up, right? Well, I know, I know it's just hard to to have a DNA test, and for especially for Native Americans, because you have to think about the control group. Who is their control group? And if the control group is from the Northwest, there's a very small chance that a Southeastern Native American is going to show up on the DNA test. I think that when we're talking about the DNA tests and, you know, I think that's probably the most, one of the most common questions that we have um, in the South. 
And that is particularly because they think that any of these DNA tests will be able to tell them which tribe they come from, but it is not, it is not a possibility. Um, each of the tribes, there are over 575 federally recognized tribes. There's over a thousand tribes. And that's after the annihilation of 90% of the population. And so what you have remaining is um, these people that are popping up and they're saying, well, you know what, I'm 5% Native American on my, on, on, you know, in my line. And, you know, to that point, I always try to mention, you know, what, what are you doing about it? Because at this particular juncture with things happening the way they are here in the South, like we're dealing with erasure, like I'm gonna need you to learn a little bit more about where you think you come from. And in the South, you know, we've been having these conversations about, um, sharing the knowledge of the people that were here previously, um, having some of their voices come and back back here um, and some of the some of the festive the performances come back here and the songs and you know take advantage of that. There's no reason in this day and age why we should still be we should not hold ourselves accountable. You know, TikTok has this huge native population that does educational pieces. Native Twitter is one, one thing that's, you know, blowing up. Um, social distance powwows got over 250,000 people on it from all of the nations and Canada and people all over the world. And so with that, everybody is reaching out in any form or fashion to have people listen. Listen to this story that we're telling you because it's an integral part of a worldview of how the indigenous people uh, continue to be, the resilience of the of indigenous people, not only here in, um, in America, but across the world. You know, we, we are still maintaining our languages, we're still maintaining our cultures, but there's also uh, indigenous brilliance, you know, with scientists, astronauts, poets, authors, um, fashion industry, and all of that is because we are fighting a battle that was perceived or put upon us from pop culture that makes all the Indians look the same, and we are not. We are all different people with different languages, different colors, different ways of believing, and so that's the battle. So when you talk about, well, I had a DNA test, I challenge you, go find out more. And always keep in mind that it's not, I mean, I, I just find this the funniest thing. I have a friend who is actually um, enrolled in the, in the Cherokee uh, tribe in North Carolina, and his DNA test came back as, is Southeast Asian. <laughs> so so don't be discouraged if it if it comes back and I mean it's just it's something different. Thank you so much for that insight, um, and I think that kind of answers. Uh, there was a follow up uh, from the same person about: Is there a DNA testing company that has the largest pool of da data for Native Americans or other Indigenous peoples in the Americas? I'm going to go on the hunch that there isn't, uh, and so we really can't be so reliant on these DNA tests. We kind of have to do the work. I mean, it's it's so easy to just be like, I'm going to send a test and I'm going to get all my answers. I mean, we're in such a uh, world right now where accessibility, you know, we just go online and Google something. Uh, so in this case, we actually have to look through the records, talk to our, you know, our ancestors, our community and see what we can identify. I think that's um, really what's most important and prevalent here. Um, I, I do want to, uh, we have a wonderful group of questions here as well. So. Uh, someone, uh, thank you so much for this presentation. It's obvious that you both have worked tirelessly to begin and lead this organization. What was your experience in bringing different tribal groups and governments together? Is the question. As I, I think uh, it's, it's pretty open-ended as, as far as like, um, you know, has it been easy? I, I'm guessing like been challenging because you're passionate about it. Has it just been I think it was in the beginning, it was a, a little bit 
uh, challenging. I know before we even started uh, this organization, before me and Valerie started really working together or met, I did a speech and uh, we, I just, I really wanted to do a stomp dance. And um, I had a dear friend, uh, Dami, who was helping me organize it. And it took so much to gather a few of us together because th there was just so much erasure. There was me, there were uh, two women from the neighboring city. Um, he came from Northern Alabama. We had three people, no, two people come from Southern Alabama and another person from Florida and one person from Oklahoma. <laughs> so it was pretty difficult um, in the beginning just because, I mean, we're so spread out now. I think that when we had the first Indigenous Peoples Day and we realized how how much work there had to be done um, in terms of bringing those voices back here. I can, I can reflect back to um, that day and hearing that first hit of the drum. And when, they, when our friends from the Mississippi Choctaw a Band of Indians started to sing, I thought how glorious that they have brought these voices back on this ancestral land, you know, and it was a beautiful moment, you know, tribe to tribe, because in, in essence, when we meet another one, we're like relatives anyway. So we call them our brothers and our sisters. And um, since then, we have started to bring so many more people on board that we were able to have um, blue, blue flutes at our Rethink Thanksgiving Day event. And we had a gentleman from the Cherokee Cherokee uh, tribe that was present talking to us about, you know, the peace pipe and some of the art, art some of the things that he, he found and it, and it keeps building and our, we've been trying to do a little bit of community partnerships and, and building these relationships to let, you know, let Montgomery and all the surrounding areas that were here. So we've been facilitating conversations between um, UAB and the Muscogee Creek, Auburn and Muscogee Creek. We have, you know, uh, murdered missing indigenous women conversations. There's just, there's a lot that we look forward to in terms of how we grow and continue to build upon, you know, build upon what we've already done. We also have uh, the Alabama Skitua uh, from Tuskegee, and they're starting to really get involved with a lot of our events, too. And they're, I mean, they're so eager to learn and want to know more. It's really, I, I muted myself. Uh, I was saying it's really exciting uh, to see them get involved with so many of our events recently. I, I truly love the collaboration and just how you're all connected. And I think that's one of the perks of technology, you know, it can get us a little bit closer without having to open up that, you know, white cages uh, for those that still know what those are uh, that are here with us today. Um, another question that we have from our audience, uh, do you have any suggestions on what, what could one do to support Indigenous communities from international places? Uh, one example, our, our speaker or our audience member, in their case, they're from Germany. So I wonder if you have any I think it's the same thing. I mean, I think that, um, again, with, with technology being the way it is, um, that certainly somebody's speaking somewhere, you know, and I think that it's a matter of, you know, finding those voices and making sure that you are trying to be an ally with them and listen to the, the stories that they're, that they're telling. Um, I think it works that way for any other, in, you know, indigenous group, not just here stateside. I'll, uh, I'll also jump in briefly, just because uh, when we actually first started this cultural talk story series, uh, our first group that we spotlighted were the Sami, uh, which are part of Scandinavia and uh, individual, specifically our speaker at the time uh, was in Finland. And so um, their technology has brought us a lot closer. And so um, I would say I'm open invitation to people in our audience, feel free to reach out to me, uh, happy to have a further conversation about what community you may be looking for and 
through the grapevine, we may be able to put the email for the office at uhipfy.edu there. Uh, we do have some additional questions I want to get to. There are some going back to the DNA. I'm just going to read them out loud. Uh, I used DNA, someone used a DNA test with Ancestry and 23andMe, then filtered results with modern DNA relatives that led them actually to South, uh, back to South Carolina, back to 11 generations of Talisi in Alabama. Uh, and then somebody else had mentioned how Oh, so um, actually someone also wanted to point out that uh, when it comes to a lot of these companies like 23andMe, Ancestry, uh, they actually own the rights uh, to all these DNA tests. So they own the rights to your genetic code after you use their test uh, along with any inaccuracy. So just a little caution to the wind out there. Um, another question we had out there, um, what is the long-term vision for the future of education with an Indigenous-focused lens? Um, my long-term vision is to fix the education system and include Natives in the conversation. Um, where I went to school, uh, the schools were actually on my grandfather's land. Um, and <laughs> I remember being in sixth grade, actually, before I went to the school that was on where my, my grand, grandfather's house was sitting. I remember in sixth grade, my teacher miss, mentioning uh, Christopher Columbus and I raised my hand and said, my ancestors were here first and I, I got in trouble. Um, so I, I was shut up for all of those years. I was shut up uh, when my high school was uh, throwing a pep rally for um, the Trail of Tears and the, the students were shouting, uh, shouting, Trail of Tears, Trail of Tears. And so my hope for the future is to change all of that. Um, and if they would have just included indigenous people in the conversation, then I mean, it, it probably wouldn't have happened <laughs> if anybody was educated on how serious uh, something like the Trail of Tears was. I think my vision, um... And I, and I hearken back to when my youngest daughter was in school and, and I, I had three children that have been through this, this school system. Um, and at that time, she, she came back with a little coffee stained t-shirt with fringes on it um, and a little headband with a fake feather on it. And it had an Indian name on it. And she showed it to my mother who was full-blooded full Oglala Lakota. I said, this is what we did today. No, that is exactly what has to be changed all over the United States in, in every aspect. I mean, we are all completely different. It had nothing to do with the people here. Most of the, the school systems can't even name whose land they're on, you know, and those are the things that we need to isolate and at the very minimum incorporate into into the curriculum. You know, in terms of curriculum itself, a lot of people are writing curriculum and it's, it's there on the internet to, you know, from all of the tribes, you just have to look. And many of it falls in line with all of the standards. And so is it a process? Yes, it is a process, but I think that we deserve to let our children know these truths so that we can move forward um, together. Uh, another thing that I also uh, want to see is um, a reclaim of our footprints. Uh, when you step into uh, even my hometown, Prattville, um, when you go to Montgomery, there's no representation. There's like no trace that we were ever there. And I feel like I have to go all the way to, uh, to Oklahoma or to North Carolina or all the way uh, down to Florida to see any kind of representation. So that's another thing that I wanna see. Um, the only thing that we have in the city of Montgomery um, are a few signs downtown and they're just so, some of, there's only three and I know one in particular is just so gross because it's talking about um, how the natives attacked uh, the British, and it's, I mean, it's completely inaccurate. I would also say mascots. <laughs> Stop with all the mascots, yes. And I, I think uh, 
this past year with uh, the social movements, there's been thankfully some nudge toward uh, reevaluating those mascots, definitely. I mean, there's still much more work to be done. Um, so we have a couple more questions here. I'm just gonna try to kind of paraphrase most of them into one in lieu of our time here. Um, so there's definitely a lot of people that want to provide further support education for their families and so forth. Um, so one person asked, uh, is there like a main source for all the truth and stats you shared earlier? Uh, they're actually trying to build their own curriculum and guidance. Any guidance would be truly helpful. At this time, I would say no. Um, I think that a lot of people, um, and I'm, I want to say like Chickasaw sent me a whole link um, when I was asking questions about, you know, their story. And they, they sent me a whole link. It included all of the different grade levels and so forth. And I think that, you know, it's, it's out there at this particular time. There's not an app. There's not a, a general place where you could go. Um, of course, you know, in this day and age, a lot of things with language revitalization are, are huge as well. So uh, I guess, I guess in, it depends on where it's coming from and who you're trying to, who you're trying to represent with your curriculum. But I do, uh, I do also know that there is uh, Indigenous Peoples of the USA, which was written by a Native American woman. And she has, there's a teen, there's an adult version, there's a teen version, and she has a curriculum guide to that. So that would be a helpful start. Thank you. Uh, and yes, uh, I, I think uh, part of it's also like, the information has been shared, we're storytellers, we're, you know, orally shared. Uh, and so collecting it, and as we all know, history is written by those who uh, have conquered uh, the conquista. And so we have to be just be a little bit more conscientious about everything we read with, you know, not just accepting it at face value. Um, I will say, depend. so uh, for those of you who are not from Hawaii who are on today, um, we do have very, I mean, even when we talk about Native Hawaiians or Kanaka Maoli, there are different, it, it's not like one, okay, that encompasses all the indigenous of Hawaii. No, there's actually multiple tribes within that. Uh, so that's one of the first things I think it's really important to see that, you know, you can't just throw one name on it and be like, okay, we're covering everything. Uh, although there are schools here that teach on the Hawaiian values and, and um, it's, it's not going to cover everything, I think. So it's, Little by little, I think it's, it's going to be time. Uh, someone, uh, the audience did ask uh, if they could, the slides could be shared with them, um, just for if, if you're comfortable with that or uh, you let us know. Uh, I get a head shaking, wonderful. So I, I'll be sure to send it out to everyone who registered uh, for today's event. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that kind of covers the majority of it. Uh, I would say for a lot of the questions, uh, and there are some questions about, <clears throat> Indigenous communities in Canada's uh, networking with them, or Indigenous communities uh, Taíno, uh, which are there's actually a good portion of Puerto Ricans tend to be Taínos, and there's a good portion of Puerto Ricans here in Hawaii itself. Um, I'd say there's lots of knowledge out there. There's stuff online. Obviously, don't believe everything at face value, especially if it's on Wikipedia. But um, you know, there's a lot of great nonprofits out there, such as the Alabama Indigenous Coalition, uh, that are doing some great work, especially if you see that there is some great, sometimes uh, lean toward the nonprofits as opposed to the government, because it's going to be a little bit swayed as to what you're reading on those government pages. So, um, and I think similar to this talk story, there's other talk stories that are uh, providing space uh, to Indigenous communities and lots of national and international organizations that have been doing this for a long time. So I definitely encourage you to delve into and reach out to some of those organizations. But I'm going to just uh, close it out right now. But I do want to thank today uh, Valerie and Tori for providing us the opportunity to learn about your community. Thank you for assisting to make this event a reality. It was truly wonderful, thought provoking and it's such a wonderfully informative event. Uh, I appreciate your insights uh, into the focus of Indigenous people. 
uh, all over to provide guidance to move forward into uncharted shifting situations and challenges ahead. Uh, so I look forward to seeing your uh, education vision realize as time goes on and I know we'll be in touch definitely. So thank you. I truly love the reminder of collaboration, community connection between each other, but also just being inclusive. I think it's so important of our ancestry and uh, we need to know our history before we can move forward really. Uh, and thank you for allowing us to be a guest at your home today. Uh, last but not least, thank you to all for joining today's webinar. We deeply appreciate your interest and support in sitting down at our table to learn about indigenous communities near and far through our cultural talk story series. Thank you again, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Really enjoyed it. <laughs>